Hello everybody, it's James here with WSI. I'm going to do some plugs first. There's some books there you can buy behind me on Amazon, The Rock and Owen Hearts, should you wish to. And my next guest, who's already grinning at me, uh, so I can, I can see him on the screen grinning at me, uh, ECW original, WWF Attitude original, it is the blue guy himself. Blue Meanie, how are you doing, my friend? Ah, oh, what's up, brother? How you doing, my friend? Oh, no, it's so tough. I've got screens both sides, so like I can just see your reaction when I really do my best <laughs> not to like mess up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can really, you know, I, I laugh because I can relate. Uh, you know, that's me doing my uh, cameo videos. I'm like, oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> how was I born with no lips? I can't pronounce words. You know? how, is, how is the cameo thing going on? Uh, during a, the pandemic is fantastic. It's good now, but you know, uh, it's amazing what people will pay money to have you say. It's, it's pretty cool. Do you have uh, any weird, weird requests? Uh, Mrs. Meanie was popping. Uh, the one time I had to do a, uh, can you do this message for my friend who's a school teacher and tell her to keep her head up and all that stuff. And then, uh, right after that, I did one. Hey, can you tell my friend, you know, Tom to go fuck off? Uh, <laughs> just, all right. Yeah. I, I I don't know how you are with the swears here, but uh, I I swear that'll be my only swear. No, but. no, 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 you may. I, I normally says you may swear. Uh, apparently, now we've been saying this word off off the air. Apparently, you can't say the c word on YouTube. They've got an issue with that, along oh, with okay. uh, along with certain slurs that I uh, will not repeat. <laughs> No, but, no, um, no, I don't want to get you thrown off the YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been thrown off plenty of times. I, got, in the past. I had enough trouble getting ECW thrown off of uh, TV like once or twice, so that's about it. But I don't want to get you thrown off the YouTube. Uh, EC, okay. Is there a story behind that that you had? Uh, the well, the one I can remember off the top of my head is when I was uh, Blue Dust. I was uh, the the Blue Dust promo where I was naked in the park. We got, <laughs> got thrown off of uh, the MSG network that week. <clears throat> and uh, Tommy Dreamer comes to me and goes, yeah, the, the, the guy from the network says, you had this big blue guy covered in paint. You know, we can't have that on our hair. So <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what the other one was. But, um, yeah, we got thrown off of MSG twice, you know. And then in the, uh, the, the one week what we did to make good at the uh, TV, we gave out that week's TV to everybody in attendance at Queens as they were exiting me and Nova stood there with like a box of tapes here, 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 here. And, you know, get everybody that week's TV that they, they missed. Was it, uh, was the other one related to nudism? Like the first that you got thrown off with? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I know it was definitely naked blue dust, which I almost got arrested for <laughs> uh, two sides. Like, you couldn't have scripted it any better. A couple seconds after, you know, cut, a big spotlight, you know, shines on me and I'm naked. And, you know, instead of doing the usual thing of covering up, I like Chris Farley and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the cops' exact words were, um, I don't know what you guys are doing, but I don't want to do the paperwork on this. Just please stop. And it was, it's me naked covered in blue cake icing because I forgot to paint. So me and Dreamer ran to the local supermarket and got food coloring and uh, and food coloring, uh, cake icing and food coloring, blue, preferably, and uh, <laughs> covered me up. We we spackled me with that, and then um, I'm on. We're in this like a little playground in the middle of some residential neighborhood, and it, it's me, uh, Paul. Raven, Sandman, uh, Stevie, Lori, uh, Tyler, his uh, eight-year-old son, <laughs> and a film crew. And it must look like the most bizarre porn set That's ever. What I was going to say, it sounds like, I mean, did the police just think, listen, this is some like real yeah. Rob Black kinky shit that you're filming. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, the, 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 the last words were like, I don't want to do the paperwork on it. <laughs> of course, Sandman goes, yow. Uh, can we do one more? And I'm like, oh, and we were like, no, stop, stop, stop. Yeah, you know, get the hook, get the hook. You know, I, uh, like, no. why did you choose a playground? Because if I was going to be naked in public somewhere, I think that'd be the first place I get arrested. Hey, that that's what they booked, man. Um, this was like the week after Goldust's naked promo where he's covered with the Intercontinental belt. 
And I think it had to be a playground because they also had done some, like they, they filmed a bunch of stuff. They filmed, uh, you know, Raven, you know, sitting there in the, in the rocks or whatever. And then Stevie like on a swing set, I mean, they filmed a whole bunch of different stuff in that playground. But I guess I was going to be the coup de gras because I had to, you know, be naked <laughs> and covered by the meanie doll, uh, which I still have over here, over on my, my shelf. But, uh, yeah, just, uh, <laughs> it's like one of those things, man, you know, uh, you know, if, if you told anybody else, well, what'd you do at work today? I was naked in a playground, you know, put that on your W2. You've got to frame that as at work though. I mean, what did yeah. you do today? Uh, yeah. Can, can I also ask this? Has, did Paul sure. Heyman ever, ever, ever ask for permission to do anything like that ever? Or was it always guerrilla filmed and in out as quick as you can? Uh, run and gun, guerrilla filming. Um, I mean, two of my favorite, you know, guerrilla position, not guerrilla position, you know, run and gun, guerrilla film it was we did the BWO in uh, Times Square for Christmas. And me and Stevie are in our gear, in our BWO gear, and we're just, we're by Rockefeller Center where they're ice skating, we're by the tree. And, you know, in between shots, you know, we run over and put our, our jackets on. <clears throat> but, you know, there's one thing where they're, 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 there's a, a, a street uh, carol, carol, street singer. I can't say words today. And he's singing Christmas songs and he's got his little boom box and his mic. And, you know, uh, he's singing and we go over there and we're like, you know, just film that guy. So we run over there and Stevie grabs the mic out of the guy's hand and goes, BWO, BWO. And, and the guy's radio thing falls over and breaks. And we, uh, we like, look at it, look at him and go and, and just run away. It was just, <laughs> and then like, uh, literally like a, a minute or two later we're walking and this uh street santa comes up hey you're on tv uh can i be on tv sure and uh stevie's like can you uh take a stevie kick <laughs> he, explained <laughs> to, he explained it to the street santa and we we ran the skit and like Stevie him with Stevie kick and he took a bump on concrete. The street saying that who, who wasn't a wrestler, he just just did it to be on TV. And we did like two takes. <laughs> <laughs> and he got up and we're like, all right, thank, thank you. And, and we just walked off. And then um, uh, you know, uh, we we're I was doing a promo in Venice Beach when I was the blue boy, and uh uh Paul gave us the rundown. He fed it to Fonzie because Fonzie was there for whatever reason. I was going to do a promo that led into uh, Mikey and Sinister Minister. But I, you know, I, I had lost like a whole bunch of weight at the time. And, you know, I was, you know, the, the, the guy who used to be fat, who's like in shape now. And I make fun of people now. And uh, they're like, just find somebody. So I get out, you know, we pull up to, we're in like Venice Beach or something like that. And we get out of the car and there got there. A guy goes, Hey, aren't you the blue meaning? I go, Hey, you want to be on TV? And it was that, that simple. We got, we got up. I had to cut the promo on them and, you know, beat them. I, we got, I think we gave him a couple tickets to uh heat wave and that was it. But it's just like run and gun. Just, you know, it's easier to ask for uh, forgiveness than permission. Exactly, you know? a fine, a fine saying that we may have both first heard from Jim Cornette. I remember him saying it quite a lot. Yeah, it's true. Is there anything in a vignette or something like that where you were just like, "That's a step too far for me. I just, I couldn't do it." And then, or maybe suggested something a bit le more tame. Uh in a promo, nah, um, no, nah, no, nah, just do it. Look, I was so young in the business when I got the ECW. It was just, uh, yes, let's do it. Yeah, we'll make it work. And, uh, you know, just, I mean, of course, you know, we went over the line with the uh, Sandman crucifixion angle. But, um, you know, even with that, I even as uncomfortable I felt doing that, I was just like, you know, we've we've done crazier things, you know, with between, you know, you know, violence and, you know, it was, you know, politically incorrect and damn proud of it. That was our motto. So, 
I just went along with for the ride, you know, and, uh, yeah, there wasn't, wasn't anything over too overly where I was just like, yeah, that's too much. You know, it was just, we'll, we'll see how it goes and make it work with the uh, crucifixion thing. I always think, because, uh, yeah, I'm not religious. I, it, I know I, I, you're Catholic, aren't you? Or you, or like uh, you and Steve were Catholic. So it hit a lot, a lot harder bad. for you guys with, um, with me, I thought the sort of worst thing about that was they did it on the floor where practically no one could see it. Yeah. Instead of doing it in the ring and like, like constructing a nice stand for the cross, like, it would have been more impactful. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, well, you... uh, Raven said he, he wanted to do a Star David, but he was afraid, he was afraid Sam would roll away. You know, <laughs> just the circle keep rolling away. <laughs> but with that, uh, Raven's whole idea of doing it on the floor was the element of surprise. Where we're beating them down and we're we're crowded around them and nobody can see what we're doing until we raise them, and that's when the <gasps> you know happens. When you know when, when you do the you know lift them up and do the reveal. Whereas if we did in the ring, everybody's like looking and watching it happen. You know they they can see what's coming, but if you do it on the floor and raise them out of nowhere, you know that's you know the more of the element, a bigger element of surprise. Yeah. Do you um? Because this wasn't actually on TV, but I think it was filmed and then shown maybe in a documentary or something. Uh, the yeah, most right. insincere, sincere apology ever with Raven. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, Raven was good for those. <laughs> um, eh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, eh, but I'm. Not. Um, yeah, but it's just like you know he didn't want to. You know, Raven was, tr- you know, trying to always trying to stay true to his, his character, trying to be a true heel, you know, whether it be in the ring or out in public, you know, he, he kept up the persona, you know, there's, a, there's a great time where, uh, you know, me and he would have me and Stevie pick us up, pick him up, sorry, in his gear, in our gear. I can't speak today. <clears throat> we would have to go to Raven's house in our gear, pick him up, drive to the building and look like a faction walking into the building. So he lived on at this, in this apartment, uh, on South street in Philly, which is kind of like a, a busy area. <laughs> we go pick him up and, uh, I forget what we're waiting for, but it's me, Stevie, Kimona and Raven just outside of his apartment. I'm half shirt, Daisy Dukes, eyes painted, Stevie's half shirt, Daisy Dukes and, you know, Raven, you know, just looking like a Raven kimono. And guy walks by and goes, man, you look like that wrestler. I see on t- that Raven guy he goes, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> guy goes, I could swear, man, you look just like him. Now it's Raven surrounded by Bloom Heaney and Stevie Richards in our hair shirt and Daisy Dukes. I've got my raccoon eyes on. And uh, <laughs> guy goes, man, you look just like, him. nah, it wasn't me. Oh, wow. You probably check it out. It's on the, you know, and he gave the chat and just walked away. And we're just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and just go, Hey Raven, what's up? He probably went, Hey, what's up? But that when, as soon as you start doing that, Hey man, you look like this guy. And it, nah, it wasn't me. <laughs> Did, um, was this around like Halloween or something? Cause I'm sort of reminded no. of the kiss story of, one day their car broke down. They was all in gear and they had to leave the stadium quickly before they changed out. So it happened to be Halloween night that night. So they just thought, it's half a mile away, the hotel. We might as well just walk out there. And everybody was like, hey guys, great outfits. I was like, brilliant. Couldn't have happened on a better day. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I, for a second, I thought you were talking about me because we did the kiss. Uh, Sorry. From, I, uh, <laughs> I was like, when did my car break down? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, but, uh, I completely forgot about the. Oh my god! I'm just like I, my brain's fried as well. But uh, I say as well, my brain's fried. If I say as well, I'm saying your brain's fried. So do excuse the slip of the tongue. You're I, good. I yeah. uh, so if the there's a kiss and the BWO and all the parodies and stuff like that. But I'm actually going to bring you back a bit and ask sure. you what well, actually why you weren't in Manchester for the uh, original No Mercy pay per view. That's a good question. I w- I would have loved to have been there. Uh, I have no no reason why I, I wasn't there. My uh, first show, my first show, that one as well. Really? Yeah, Manchester. My first, my first, my first time in England was uh, the tour after WrestleMania 15. It was WrestleMania 15. Then we did Raw in at the Meadowlands, 
And then the next day we flew over and we were in Dusseldorf, Newcastle. I want to say Manchester. That was the pay-per-view and you weren't on the pay-per-view. Really? I don't think you were. I even checked a little Wikipedia and searched. I, I, control F, blue. And there was nothing there, nothing there. So I'm assuming you weren't on the show. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry. Would they do, have done a pay-per-view that close to WrestleMania? Uh, that was the, that was in April, so it would have been a few weeks after WrestleMania. Yeah, I, I have no clue. I don't know. I I can only register my disappointment that you were. Is that there. around? Is that the, around the time Vince Russo left? No, Vince Russo left about October, so this was April of okay. '99. So uh, it was before Backlash, and about five weeks or six weeks before we're Over the Edge. Okay, and the ironic part is, you know, I showed up to. It was another show at the Meadowlands, and that's when we all found out Russo left for WCW, and that all the boys had just flown back from a, a UK pay per view, so they're all tired, and we're all just like, "Yeah, Vince Russo left," and we're just like, oh, "What are we gonna do?" All right, and it was just business as usual. I know. um, do you know what? Right, I'm actually going to bring up Vince Russo later, uh, and I will ask you about when Vince Russo. Do you know what? Actually, forget it. it doesn't matter. We don't need to be sequential. So Vince Russo leaves sort of like very early October, I think. And he uh, hands his note. Well, I don't even hand his notice, and he just rings up Vince and says, "I'm done." Someone, I do you know what? It was a uh, Charles Warrington head banger mosh said to me. Yeah. The only, the only storylines that were in place were for the top guys, and then everybody underneath just started floundering because no one really knew it, it was almost like everything was just erased and then started off again uh was that your uh experience of when v- russo left did you feel it was sort of a bit left out in the cold a little bit a little bit it just seemed well also i was, I was kind of a vince russo signing where he um you know he wanted to you know when wwe was expanding their television and uh they wanted, uh, they needed more talent. They were going to, have to do Sunday night heat and eventually, you know, uh, raw. And then there's talks of SmackDown and they needed more talent. So he was a big fan of ECW and he brought me in. So it's kind of like when, um, you know, if you're a recording artist and the guy who signs you to the label leaves the label, they usually get rid of all the recording artists that that person brought in. So I was a Vince Runa so signing. So I felt like kind of like, all right, you know, uh, this probably isn't good for me <laughs> since he signed, he got, he brought me in, but, uh, yeah, it felt like, you know, a little bit, you know, that, you know, I was on a little bit on the back burner. Hmm. It also didn't help that, you know, my character wasn't created by them. If the, your WWE created wrestler, then, you know, they'll, they'll push you to the moon or, well, they'll give you more opportunities, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, it, I, the character wasn't a WWE creation. Vince Russo brought me in, but uh, you know, they tried, you know, they, they sent me to Memphis for a little bit and, uh, to try to reinvent myself, but you know, things didn't work out, but, uh, yeah, just, um, and yeah, Vince Russo was a good guy to go to for me because, you know, uh, you know, when gold dust stole Al Snow's head and, uh, I was like, Hey, you know, I was thinking of ideas cause it looked like the job squad was about to break up. Uh, I went to Vince. So I was like, Hey, you know, Goldust just stole Al Snow's head. Uh, Goldust plays is the guy who's playing mind games with everybody. What if I brought back, I did blue. I said, I did blue dust in ECW. What if blue dust came back to, you know, steal Al Snow's head back from Goldust? you know, the guy who, uh, you know, the parody of the guy who does the mind games is playing mind games with the guy who plays mind games. And as I'm telling Vince Russo is like, you know, smiling. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. And he pitched it and he was just like, okay, we're going to do it. I was like, well, do you want me to get new gear made up? He's like, nah, just wear what you wear. Wore in ECW. I, was like, <laughs> I was like, you sure? Yeah. It's like uh, the onesie, wasn't it? It's like the shorts onesie. Those were Looney Tune pajamas that me and Raven <laughs> And Raven went to some mall in center city, Philadelphia and, and, and bought a pajama set. And we took it to the arena, got some Krylon spray painted it blue, uh, to the point where people are like, can you stop spray painting that in the locker room? We can't breathe. Uh, <laughs> I was like, y- you sure? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I was going to get a bl- whole blue dust suit made up, you know, 
you know, from Goldust's uh, uh, seamstress. No, that's where I, so I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll spend a little extra money. I'll get the back airbrushed, you know? <laughs> and uh, that was it. Uh, but like he was, Vince was always, always open to my ideas and, you know, he brought me into WWE. So when you know, we found out he, he was gone, I was just like, Ooh, you know, I, just waiting for the, uh, you know, for, uh, the, you know, the downward spiral. So well, uh, well, uh, we'll, we'll bat back and forth here, but I, I, uh, I, when did you first get the call that was it actually Vince Russo? You said Vince Russo calls you and says, I like your stuff. Do you, will you consider coming to the WWF or was there another process or did Al Snow recommend you? Cause I know he trained you. Uh, there, there had been talks of bringing me in earlier, uh, as the blue boy to do a parody of the nitro girls. Which we have <laughs> I don't know that. What's, what's that story? Oh, well, um, uh, back in the day in the nineties when we had AOL, I'm, I'm sitting there on the computer and uh, a little, it's a message box pops up. It's Al Snow. It says, where were you? I go, uh, I'm home. Uh, what's going on? He's like, he's like, no, you were booked for raw in Baltimore. They had music for you. They had, you were on the lineup sheet They had everything planned out and you weren't there. It's like, Al, I swear to you, I had no idea. This was, I, I, I know nothing. He goes, okay. So he goes back and tell, you know, tells Vince Russo, he goes, I mean, he was never told. Apparently I was booked for raw in Baltimore. Um, and you know, the, I was going to be the blue boy come out as the nitro girl, you know, as a parody of the nitro girls, whatever, but still be an ECW, you know, kind of thing, you know, just a little crossover. And Ventruso was like, and you know, uh, Ventruso had asked Candido Candido went to Paul said, Hey, you know, brought it up. And then they told WWE, I was all on board and they didn't tell me. So it was kind of like they were ribbing WWE using me to rib WWE. So I found that out and I was like, well, if my career's not totally ruined, uh, next time they come calling, I'm going, I, 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 I gotta go. Well, I probably would have went anyway, but you know, you know, I love ECW, but you know, I, I have, you know, I had a family to support. Mm. And you're playing but, starving uh, artists somewhat in ECW, aren't you? In comparison to the pay that WWF would have given you, surely. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people say, you know, you know, a lot of wrestlers goes, oh, I paid my dues. Well, you know, when, you know, not only do, you know, the wrestlers pay dues, but families pay dues, you know, uh, my mom and my grandma, well, I was raised by my mom, my grandparents and my grandfather had passed. And, um, you know, we moved, to, we moved back to Philly from Jersey. It was, it was rough. You know, I was, you know, I had the wrestling habit and they were supportive. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I was supposed to be a uh, blue boy and, uh, or, uh, yeah, raw boy. They're going to bring me back, back as raw boy. That didn't happen. So the second time around, uh, I got home from a booking in Pittsburgh and there's a message on my machine from Al. Hey, give me a call. Okay. So I, you know, I give Al a call. He goes, Hey, uh, are you under contract to WWE? I went, no. He's like, um, if you had an opportunity to go to WWE, would, would you, uh, well, he was feeling out to see how loyal I was to pause. I, uh, I, I would go. He's like, okay. Hangs up. Maybe an hour later, Bruce Pritchard calls. Okay. You know, yeah, you know, he, he talks to me. We, we, uh, he asked for all my, uh, vital information. He goes, okay, be at, uh, the well, well, it wasn't the Wells Fargo center then it was the first union center or, uh, there's, it's been eight different buildings since then be at the building Sunday, 11 AM. It was an earlier show because there was, I, there was either a, a football either a basketball or a hockey game that night. So we had to do like a, a matinee. We had the building early. Cool. So I was me and my, me and my mom and my grandma were living in this small apartment, in South Philly, one floor. So I walk out of my bedroom to the living room, about 20 feet. 
I looked at my grandma and I said, put all the bills in my name. And she was like, what? She knew, you know, I wasn't making that much. I was like, put all the bills in my name. She went, why? I said, I just signed with the WWE. And she, she like grabbed onto the chair right next to her. Like her, her knees almost went out from under her. I was like, yeah. And then yeah, I got, my mom was like Edith Bunker. Oh! <clears throat> and I was like, yeah, I just signed WWE and they put all the bills in my name. And, uh, my grandma didn't live. She lived for another two years, but I made sure like the, the next two years were the most stress-free two years of her life, of the rest of her life. Uh, um, just going on something you said before, because I'd actually like to uh, pick up on it, is Al Snow rang you first, just to feel you out. Then Bruce yeah. Pritchard called afterwards. It sounds feel, to me when you describe it, well, feel you up. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know how close you and Al Snow are. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> it sounds to me like they were trying to get around contract tampering yeah. to see if you had yeah. a contract, and then Bruce, as an office member, could speak to you. Is that that probably is like probably, a- probably? But uh, you know, I don't know how you know Paul could have got mad at that because you know we, you know we would learn later on that you know WWE was getting a w- weekly check from WWE. So, uh, maybe that's just how they did business because, you know, whether it's with how they used to, you know, talk to WCW guys at the time, but you know, for me, I mean, Bruce Pritchard would come to ECW shows randomly, you know, the first time I met Bruce Pritchard, you know, while I was in the business was at the ECW show in Reading, Pennsylvania, he just came to hang out, you know, uh, Tom Pritchard would come just hang out. And then we, we slowly start getting, you know, some of their, uh, developmental guys like draws and uh, Brockus, Akamal, mm. uh, Akamal Albright, uh, you know, and then they're, you know, F- Furnace and Lafon, you know, would come in and we're like, hey, kind of like starting put, putting two to two, two and two together. And then, you know, for the, our pay-per-view, we had this great lighting rig and the, the word was, you know, WWE helped set us up with the lighting is, you know, told Paul how to, you know, you know, with the, the, the money, you know, you put the pay-per-view money in escrow and then three months later, that's when you start paying out the royalties. So WWE was helping us in a lot of ways. It just wasn't like boom in your face, you know, about it, you know, it, you, you start putting, you know, if you pay attention, you start putting two and two together. So when they reached out to me for me to sign with the WWE, I, I, they did it in a way where they probably had to, they were used to doing it. But they really didn't have to. They could have just came to me direct and said, "Hey." But they knew, uh, you know, my connection with Al and Al being my trainer and mentor. So, I I, uh, I, I like I like that you said uh, that the WWE was used to helping out ECW, and then they also lent them brackets. I <laughs> I can't imagine that was helping anybody out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was that was the that was the one. You know the. There, you know, he there's a reason why he was just basically the bodyguard. So, you know, you know if Ramstein was playing back then in the late nights, that'd be the most awesome music you could have picked for EC uh, for his ECW deal. That song Duhas was like the mo- one of the most over songs in the locker room for the longest time. <laughs> when that song came out, I just remember me Axel Rotten just walking around going Duhas. You know, just we had no idea what he was saying, but it just like, man, that song sounds bad as hell. Yeah, you know, we we're driving, you know, it was like going to Maryland, I, not Maryland. Uh, it was in a Massachusetts, we were like in Springfield, Mass, or something like that. We we're just like just going around, do host. And I think we, we, Alf Herman was in the locker room and we were singing it to him. And then he smartened us up to what he, they were saying. And then eventually, I think uh, Alf Herman uh, went off to become their bodyguards. He, he was touring with, uh, Rampstein for a little bit. Hmm. He started. That's playing. a name I've not heard in a million years. Oh, Alf Herman's the best. Uh, <laughs> we were. Uh, it was November to remember in New Orleans, and we had our own uh, float in the Halloween parade. And uh, you know, we had the beads and all this stuff. And Alf Herman's just like on the top of the. We're in a flatbed with the sides, so we don't you know fall over. But Alf Herman just jumps on top of the the cab and goes, ah! it's like, come on, it's like a rock concert, you know, just 
and you know women are just like ah! <laughs> they're, they're, they're too scared not to you know flash them and stuff like that but you know we're you know when in rome mm. uh it's, it's more demand know, it's more of an it's more of like a, a threat in german than it might be in, in english as well yeah yeah <laughs> But uh, yeah, Alpha was amazing. Alpha was great. We got to I got to wrestle him a bunch of times, and then uh, yeah, I reconnected with him when I started doing one PW shows. But Alpha Herman was great. Mm. I'll uh, I shall move on, and I'll give you a little game. Uh, you've watched a couple of these, which I'm very flattered uh, by that you've yeah, yeah. seen a few videos. So you know what it's going to uh, come in really. It's name association. I'm going to give you some sentences. You tell me who best fits. That okay. uh, sentence, and uh, maybe if there's a little story behind it, you know, you just uh, <whistles> slip it on in there. Uh, first one I'm going to say is funniest person in the locker room. Man, funniest person in the, uh, any locker room or specific? Any locker room. It can be any, yeah, any. Oh, man. Um, I remember Brian Lee being really funny. He, um, Brian Lee was like one of the few people or maybe the only person I know that I saw make made Perry Saturn laugh. <laughs> and it was just like, I forget what the match was as a Brian Lee. There was a, or there was a match in upstate in the upstate in the, at the orange carry fan grounds in the New York. And uh, they were brought through the building and they brought into the ladies room and there's a lady that was naked sitting in a sink as they brawled into the bathroom and they were talking about the next night at DC arena. And then like, there's a, like a sort of dreamer, the eliminators, Brian Lee, all standing around and Perry Saturn is in tears. Like, <laughs> yeah, wiping away tears. Like, cause Brian Lee Lee standing there going, but why was she butt naked? <laughs> I can understand when you're washing your butt in the sink, but, but she was butt naked and just, you know, uh, another guy who was funny in the locker room, Tracy Smothers. Um, he was on uh, Tracy Smothers was the unsung hero of ECW, uh, between helping the young guys, but Hey man, why do I hate you? What's your deal? You know, everybody had their, you know, imitation of Tracy Smothers, you know, with the FBI dance and, you know, their promos were the best, you know, guy, you know, people would just, hang around to watch them you know, uh, in ECW people would just hang around to, just to watch them fill their film their uh, vignettes and promos and stuff mm -hmm. like that you know they're beating up a plastic sand, uh, Santa Claus at Christmas and stuff like that so Brian Lee was definitely fun there was a time when <laughs> speaking of Brian Lee uh, <laughs> we're in Lulu Temple in Plymouth Meeting Pennsylvania and uh, Raven sitting in the corner you know yeah, he's got the hair in his face. You know, he's just sitting there. And I was Colonel Demini, and um, I, I forget what Stevie was. Oh, he's Baron Von Stevie. And we're just doing our shtick. And uh, Brian Lee, you see Raven's shoulders, you know, start like moving like this. Like Brian Lee's leaning into Raven's ear, and you just see Raven's shoulders start shaking, shaking, shaking. And, you know, Raven, we get back in the locker room and Raven's like, man, you almost made me break out there. I was like, he's like, me and Steve were doing our, our shtick as, you know, Baron Von Stevie and, uh, and, the uh, blue dust or whatever, uh, Colonel Domini and Brian Lee leans in and goes, man, they're killing me. You know, it's, he's <laughs> one of these things in, in Raven's ear and Raven would just start shaking, you know, <laughs> Brian Lee was, you know, it was funny. Uh, Tracy's mother's was hilarious. Now, I don't know if you were a big drinker back in the day. Yes. Last man standing at the bar. <sighs> Last man standing at the bar would probably have to be Sandman. Um, and here's the weird thing. It's like Sandman only drank on the weekends. It's like, uh, I don't want to kill his cover or you know, kill his uh, legacy. But like during the week, he was like Jim. And then... <laughs> Yeah, when I came to wrestling, he was he became Sandman. He walked into the locker room with two cases. Uh, he just came around, from, came back from a corner bar where he did, you know, did like three Long Island ice, iced teas or whatever. But I've never saw Sandman just like uh, you know, it's just usually like, yow, you know. 
because you know we, the, in our you know when i first went to ecw 95 through 98 and stuff like that we have we would have to do promos at the old travel lodge and mm. uh and there was a bar downstairs so they would like say go get so and so they'd have to go find them at the bar but like i've never seen sam in not you know yo <laughs> in there basically yeah He's like Rodney Dangerfield and Caddyshack. Hey, <laughs> and I just—he's always on, you know. <laughs> you get a, man at the bar is, it would have to be Sam, man. Hey, you wear a hat like that, I bet you get a free bowl of soup with it. <laughs> Looks good on you, though. <laughs> <laughs> man, I went to go see Journey on the strength of that film. Really? <laughs> the best is they kind of sped it up in the movie where he's like dancing a little bit faster and stuff like yeah. that. When we realized that Steve Perry wasn't lead singer anymore and they had like a little Chinese guy doing it and like he didn't enunciate any of the words. So it's like, so I can't do the high voice of my but any way you want it. But here we go. Yeah, it was like, come on. So, so, so we heard, don't stop believing. We heard any way you want it. And then we left. We were done. Uh, oh, you heard, you heard yeah. the hits. We heard the hits and uh, we'd already seen White Snake and Thunder. <laughs> Thunder. There's, there's a blast from the past. Nobody really talks about them. Oh, God. Uh, they were good. Uh, they were good. Dirt, uh, Dirty Love was their big hit for me. Mm. You know, and um, the oh, the other band was Gun. Uh, I don't know if that was a band over there, but they did a cover. Oh, what did they do? Anyway, forget it. That's uh, nothing to do with anything at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, I'll go back to Sandman. Actually, did you ever wrestle Sandman? And did anybody enjoy wrestling Sandman? Because he clearly had a few schnifters beforehand. Uh, I never really had a one-on-one match with Sandman until after ECW had closed. Um, Sandman was was good, but he was a little he was a little stiff with the cane, you know. Uh, and a few people in the locker room took issue with how he swung it, you know. Uh, you know, if he had taken pe- care of people with the cane, I don't think people would have uh, had issue with the drinking. You know, uh, I know uh, Mick Foley was kind of outspoken about uh, Sandman's drinking. And a few other people in the locker room were like, "Come on, man." You know, uh, and but you know, I, he would cane the you know the shit out of me and uh, me, Stevie and Nova, and uh, you know, I was like, "Who am I going to complain to?" I was a year and a half into the business. What am I going to do? Uh, and in in you know, there there's a a, a certain way. The best we, we start figuring out the cane. Uh, his Singapore cane had like three red strings on it. And we figure if you loosen up one or two of them, it would make it a little bit better. And the other secret to taking a Singapore cane is get in as close as you can. Cause if he hits you with the part of the cane that's closer to the handle, it bends. But if he hits you with the end of the cane, it's like a Louisville slugger, like a baseball bat. So there was this one time, uh, Raven and Sam man were in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. And, uh, <laughs> Same man drops the cane and Raven and same man are brawling around the, uh, the building. So me, Stevie and Nova look over and there's the cane. <laughs> so Nova runs over with his cape and throws his cape over the cane. And me and Stevie go under the, the cape, like we're working <laughs> the car, like, like it's a car hood. And we're like cutting the strings off, like in plain view of everybody, like they can't see us underneath this cape, like, you know, t- ding, ding, ding taking these strings off so they come back and we had to feed them for our cane shots and they felt so much better that like we almost forgot to sell or like <laughs> you know whack uh oh shit. Um, oh, oh 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 that hurt yeah it hurt but well, it really did hurt but not just not as much yeah. uh yeah but i'll give raven uh credit same man had been wrestling for a while but it, w- it wasn't until he started feuding with uh same man started feuding with raven that Sam and really kind of picked up on his psychology a little bit better and started selling a whole lot better. Uh, you know, before his few were Raven, Sam would, would kind of sell like rock em, sock em robots, you know, just like, <laughs> but Raven really taught Sam and how to sell and, uh, helped me, you know, Sam and with his psychology, you know, a, a lot as, as Raven really could contrib- contributed to that locker room overall between you know helping sam in with you know his work he created the dudleys he cre- you know brought in kimona 
came up with the Beulah character, came up with the Blue Meanie character, helped Stevie. Uh, you know, the, the, Raven's fingerprints were definitely all over that locker room when, when it came to characters because he was such a great mind for the business. It still is a great mind for the business. Mm. Uh, I'm just imagining uh, Raven going, uh, Jim, um, how about you uh, sell, sell a little differently, huh? I was, it always seems like... <laughs> I've uh, I've not smoked we to Raven all, yet. We all have our we all have our Scotty impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also learned the art of uh, negotiation negotiation when it comes to matches from Raven. Where if like there's something you really don't want to do, there's a, a better way to saying, you know, the worst thing you do is I'm not doing that. You know, you just sit there and ponder and go, oh, well, that's a good idea. But what if what if we did this way? throw in their idea but throw your own idea on top of it and if they like your idea more then they'll go with your idea instead of theirs you know yeah. there's different ways you can approach it that i learned from and they'll think know. it's their idea as well because they i suppose as well uh, I'll, I'll move on then the uh the wrestler that didn't go to the laundry as often as they could have done and uh are you going to say balls mahoney for this spoiler uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah, Balls Mahoney would probably be the uh, least um, cleanliest. Mm -hmm. uh, he would travel to the airport and his, like back in the day, like uh, Joe Boxer. Remember Joe Boxers? Like I, the boxer shorts? No, there's I these don't. boxer shorts. Uh, okay, there's these boxer shorts called Joe Boxer. The, the waistband said Joe Boxer, and they, you know, the underwear have like a, like a smiley face or different designs on them. And these were like big in the 90s. He would just go to the, airport in his boxer shorts his joe boxer boxer shorts with a t-shirt and just eh, eh, you know or you know if we were traveling in a traveling in a car with uh balls mahoney that you could have charged a mission for that you know i, I would put that up against any uh, theme park the balls, <laughs> mahoney, the balls mahoney car ride where you're you know driving through pittsburgh at like 90 miles per hour listening to typo negative you know uh yeah not the uh not the cleanliest guy. Um, <laughs> you know, just there was a, uh, Pittsburgh at the Monaca, Monaca golden dome. Uh, there was a match. He bled, you know, he got great color and he's just standing around and we're like, Hey balls. Yeah. You're going to wipe that blood off your face. Like, no, nah, Linda roof from the Japanese magazine magazines going to do a photo shoot with me. I was like, well, and then like we're like three hours go by and we're sitting around waiting for our checks and balls is sitting in the shower, just weeping like, because <laughs> apparently he thought somebody stole his gear bag and if he had just misplaced it. He, he hid his own gear bag from him. So he's sitting in the shower <laughs> covered in blood sitting on the floor, just like this sad guy uh, and it, like look i got plenty of balls mahoney stories but these aren't things i have i wouldn't say in front of him and to his face uh the locker room loved the balls mahoney he was our our mascot mm. you know he but you know a lot of things we say or about him is same things we would have said to him we're like dude what are you doing what the, what, what, they, what are you doing <laughs> you know <sighs> you know and <laughs> the story of him killing a great way with a spork and uh him getting arrested in Pittsburgh and, uh, the, you know, the, the night before, him and him and, uh, Axel were supposed to win the ECW tag belts in Pittsburgh at November, November to remember in Pittsburgh. <laughs> but, uh, balls Mahoney had a pension for drinking and going to karaoke. And, uh, he, he went to this carrier and he got to an argument with somebody and hit him and ran across the highway to the hotel and they found him at the hotel and, as he's getting arrested, he's like, I can't, you can't arrest me. I'm winning the, t I'm winning the straps of pay-per-view tomorrow. I'm the focal point. I'm the <laughs> focal point of the match. Focal point. <laughs> so anytime somebody mentions balls, Mahoney, we all go, Oh, focal point. You know, you can't, can't go to jail. You know, just. Did he so win? Did he win the belts? Did he get out in time? Uh, no, he, they, the, the plans were changed the oh, next dear. day. Yeah. But, uh, 
Balls and Axe were a great tag team. It just, just you know, they were always slipping a banana peel and undo whatever you know was supposed to happen. They were they were going to have a good run at in WWE, but just uh, they, they get in you know the story with TNA. You know they're supposed to you know do you know be brought back in and just you know slipping a banana peel, sit in the wet paint. Yeah, we always do something like to undo them, you know, undo their uh, their their upward trajectory. I I cannot not now ask why. What what's the TNA situation? Because I don't know that. Uh, well, I, I wasn't there for it, but apparently, um, they disappeared, or you know, their reason. You know, they you know actually got uh, accused of being under the influence of something. And he may have, you know, helped somebody else become under the influence of something. Uh, I don't, I don't know the story a hundred percent, so I don't want to say other names and, you know, put something wrong out in the atmosphere, but, uh, and then they publicly, you know, on social media, just like called each other out, and, like shoot interviews and stuff like that. And it's, I was going to say, I was surprised they didn't get a world title match with sting if they were under the influence on, oh, come on, <laughs> open goal. Hold on, hold on. Is, hold on. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I was not expecting I that. For, I, I was looking for the. I got. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Give me two seconds. I I forgot my. Okay, this. There we go. Thank you. I'll be here till Thursday. Tip the veal, <laughs> try the waitress. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the uh, biggest crowbar in the ring? Uh, a little bit stiffsky. A little bit stiffsky. <laughs> in ECW or anywhere? Anywhere you like. <laughs> Aside uh, from one night stand. We'll cut that bit out. Well, yeah. No, no, no. no you, that's fine. Uh, I can't. Uh, I worked with a lot of guys who worked snug where you go, ah, oh, you know, that's not too bad. Uh, oh, there's a match I get with Gangrel and WWF. It might have been for one, you know, jacked or he or whatever those undercard shows were. And he he started throwing some punches, and he's he's hit he hit me a couple times. I went and like the third or fourth time he uh, stiffed me. I went I went oh UFC oh, all Japan. He was like <laughs> he, he started covering up and 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 you know laughing, but uh, nobody really too stiff. You know, there's always snug, which is fine. You know. Uh, me and Nova did a, a match with the Dudleys a couple times, and they were snug, nothing bad, but not nothing to make you go, "Man, do I owe you money?" Mm. Uh, just, you know, nothing too bad. Um, I've been fortunate, you know. Uh, I wish I had a better name, but nobody's ever re really been bad. You know, Tracy Smothers might have caught me with one of his judo punches or whatever, but. It's Tracy. You just laugh and go, bah. you know, we laugh about in the back. Oh, sorry, man. What's your deal? Why do I hate you? You know, <laughs> what's my motivation? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you this next one then. Uh, heaviest smoker of cigarettes. Oh, my God. I'd probably have to be Sam man. Uh, Sam man or balls. Uh, yeah, because, you yeah. know, Sam man wasn't too bad with the. You know, there's some people who just smell like a walking cigarette, and he never really s smelled like cigarettes, but he he smoked a lot. Uh, Mahoney smoked a lot, so I'd probably have to say those two. Uh, and I'm sure I'm I'm leaving somebody out, but you know, went as far as you know, being in the locker room, being around the boys, I mean, and ECW was probably the only place I was really around smokers because nobody's lighting up backstage at you know WWE. Except for maybe Jack Lanza or something like that. But uh, the late Jack Lanza as well. Uh, died a rest few days ago, yeah. Spoke with uh, Jerry Briscoe on Friday, and he had a load of stories for him as well. So that was a oh, that was an enlightening. Uh, but, but yeah, I love Jerry Briscoe, uh, Meanie. <laughs> uh, Meanie, we know you, we, you. It's your first time here. You're not used. To, well, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I've told the story plenty of times where, uh, my first weekend in, into WWE, uh, you know, I, I debuted at Philly and then we're going to do Baltimore and I want to say Hartford, Connecticut the next day. 
So being a guy who's done indies and worked for ECW, I wasn't used to flying. So I was like, I'll just drive the loop. I'll drive from Philly. I'll do Baltimore, right for Baltimore, drive straight up to Connecticut, do raw, come home, you know? And this is when they were doing, uh, you know, they would tape, you know, do live uh, Sunday night heat. They do a live raw. Next day, they would tape the following week's raw. Cool. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I and, and eventually Earl Hedner walks on me and goes, no, uh, we fly you. you you'll, you'll fly to Connecticut. Okay, cool. So he gets with me. You know, we, okay, your flight's booked. So I debut in Philly, go to Baltimore, go to Baltimore. I retire Mark Merrow. Uh, <laughs> um, and then we go to the airport the next morning in Baltimore to fly to Hartford. And I get there and I'm looking at my, uh, I, my, my ticket. I go, 1A? That's like right up front of the plane, ain't it? I go, yeah, one A. That's that's pretty up there. And I'm thinking, one A is like, oh, first class. Pro- I'm thinking I'm the row behind first class. I figure first class is just first class. I think one A is, you know, the, the you know, oh, I'll have some leg room. There won't be anybody in front of me. They'll just be that wall. No, I I was in first class. <clears throat> so. um I get to the plane. I go, um, I'm looking, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm done. You know? So I try to uh, be as inconspicuous as a 350 pound man with blue hair can be. I, I sink in my seat and, uh, it's me, big boss, man, Sean Michaels, and maybe one other person in the first row. And I'm just like, Oh my God, I'm done. I'm like, you know, you know, put up the, the, the airline magazine, whatever. <clears throat> but like, you see people walking in and they're like, looking at me, like, give me like, Oh, like, look at, I, I it's like, Oh my God. But I didn't know. I, I knew I was really was in trouble. Mick Foley walks through the door and he just looks at me and goes, Oh no. Oh mean, he no. What Mick? What? What? Hey, take me with you, Mick. Help me. Help me. <laughs> Uh, meanie no it's like a scene out of a horror movie I, no what are you what are you doing and so the flight takes off and like you hear from the back of the plane why is the blue why the bleep is the blue meanie in first class and i'm just like oh my god if there was a door right next to me i'd just open it and just you know <laughs> you know go out you know do the nasty plunge you know uh you know dive out but you, you land in, uh, we land in Hartford. Everybody at baggage planes, give me the eye. Uh, I'm traveling with Al Snow, Mick Foley and Bob Holly. And I'm just a wreck. I'm like, guys, I, how bad is it? Is somebody going to poop in my bag. And, uh, Bob Holly goes, eh, I don't think we poop in bags anymore. Yeah. Like, oh, that's a relief. <laughs> well, <laughs> nope. No pun intended. So we get to the building. And I get called into this like little side room and it's Jack Lanza and Jerry Briscoe. And it's, I think Bob Holly came along for whatever reason, but you know, uh, you know, Jack and Jerry kind of like, we're like, Hey, we know you're new here. We know, uh, you're not used to traveling, but the next, the next time, you know, offer your, your seat up to a veteran, you know? And D'Lo Brown had said that to me at baggage claim. I was like, if, if it was me, I would have gave my seat to a veteran. I was like, oh, I could have used this knowledge like two hours ago. Um, but you know, Jack and Jack Lanza and Jerry Briscoe let, you know, kind of let me off the hook and you know, Hey, we know you're new here, man. And I knew next time offer my seat to a veteran because after the whole one night stand thing with JBL, they brought me back to WWE in Sacramento. And we did a show July 4th, 2005. Uh, we wrestled. I had my match with JBL. Uh, and then we're, everybody was flying out in the red eye right after the show. So we all rushed to the airport. I get my ticket. I'm like, oh, it, it got me again. First class. So I'm like, hey, uh, Ricky Steamboat, how would you like to sit <laughs> in first class? Oh, meaning I'm good here. Oh, take the seat. <laughs> you know, I think I've been either 
R- Ricky Steamboat, I got, to- I think I got talked Tony Gurria into sitting in the first class, but I, you know, I, that's one of the things, you know, fool me once, you know, but the second part of the flight, I, I sat in first class, mm. you know, <laughs> yeah, don't blame me. I don't know. Do you know, actually, that sort of leads into one of the other things I was going to ask you was when you were with the WWF, certain road agents were more in favor than others for getting advice from. If there was like a, a ranking list of uh, agents, where would you place the best? Who would you place the guy who would fine you for being two seconds late? Um, as far as agents, I would have to say, like, I mean, Lanzo was great. Um, one of the best agents was Terry Taylor because he was just brutally honest, you know? Uh, and it's always weird because, you know, you know, each agent was different, you know, uh, me and gold dust rest the Hardy boys on Sunday night heat. And, uh, you know, the, unfortunately in the night Owen passed, but you know, I come back, me and gold dust and the Hardys come back from the match and we feel great and you know terry taylor you know pulled us aside and you know tore the match apart but then like two seconds later after you know terry taylor tearing us apart i'm walking down the hall and here comes jerry briscoe hey manny great match <laughs> so i'm just like <laughs> one guy just said you know everything we did was the original switch and then jerry briscoe goes great match you know so <laughs> It's like, uh, which way do I go? Which way do I go, George? Which way do I go? <laughs> you know, just, yeah, it's very confusing. So, um, yeah, I never really had a, a set to agent, hmm. but, uh, you know, I, I like Terry because, you know, he didn't sugarcoat anything. And Terry Taylor was one of my favorite wrestlers growing up. You know, I was a huge mark for Terry, especially uh, UWF Terry, Terry, Terry Taylor, uh, who was just brutally honest. Uh, Jack Lanza. <laughs> probably one of the funniest agents um well me and gold me and godfather were going over a match i want to say in texas at the compact center and we're calling this stuff and jack comes over and goes hey you're doing too much let's go out do this that and we went out and it, everything he said worked you know we kept it simple we were yeah tr- you know, going out there trying to have a barn burner or you know or, or, you know, it, Godfather is burned more than barns. You know, he, he likes to light them up. So, you know, uh, I love the Godfather. Okay. But uh, Jack was like, yeah, these guys are doing too much. Keep it simple. And we did. And, you know, for the spot we were on the show, it worked out. So I'll, uh, I'll give you one more and then we'll move on to a few more things here and there. But uh, most memorable backstage fight. Uh. I'm trying to think there was, a, there's a couple fights. Um, there was the infamous, uh, new Jack Pitbull Anthony fight in Queens, which really just, it, it stalled out before it could even go. And I, I most recently learned that the fight was between new Jack and, uh, Pitbull Anthony Pitbull one, uh, got into a, uh, a shouting match because I guess uh, Pipple Anthony said something to Joel Gertner and did something to Joel Gertner that New Jack didn't like. I, I can't remember at the moment. That's for a story for Joel to tell. And uh, you know, New Jack was like, you know, why don't you leave him that leave him alone? And they started like kind of like forehead to forehead argue, you know, and then they start tussling and a couple of guys dove in to, to break it up. <laughs> and she, I just remember Shane Douglas putting his arms out going, let him go, let him go, <laughs> let him fight, let him fight. And then they just rolled around the floor and no, they're jockeying for position. Nobody can really get like a good shot in. And then eventually somebody broke it up. And then, um, <laughs> did they break it up because it was just getting too boring? It, it, yeah. It's pretty, <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I got to sit there. We get out of my way, you know? I got to put my gear on. Uh, as far as locker room fights, it, it, um, well, then, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, when you think of locker room fights, I'm always thinking of, you know, 
the times where we had to fight the fans, you know, uh, you know, there was the infamous uh, riot in Plymouth meeting Pennsylvania on the uh, mischief night, you know, the night before Halloween in Philadelphia, well, right outside of Philly and Plymouth meeting, we used to run the Lulu temple and then uh, Lulu temple got sold. So we had to find a new building in the area. So we found the national guard armory in Plymouth meeting, which is right outside at Concha Hocken. And uh, it's mischief night, first night in the show, uh, first night in the building, first and last. And uh, <laughs> uh, there's like, it's right, we're right near like a local college. So there's these like drunk frat boys in the crowd, all wearing white t-shirts, you know, just uh, being boisterous. But like there was the ma- main event, it was the, the gangsters, Dudleys, uh, Balls and Axel eliminators in this big you know tag mayhem thing so balls and axel are coming to the ring and these guys are on the rail yeah and balls and axel go over yeah slap five well a couple of guys grab axel pull him over and they start clubbing on him so the whole you know the whole locker room goes what you know all the boys hop the out of the ring over the rail and then somebody in the locker room goes fight fight you know so all rush out you know big dick dudley's like windmilling people you know just like godzilla taking down buildings and all this stuff and just you know brawling and then um my favorite story is you know the the call goes out to the police there's a riot at the national guard armory so swat and canine come out you know uh (laughs) there's a riot at the national guard armory so all the police came. So Tommy Dreamer's out there trying to plead with, you know, hey, you know, uh, it's all been, it's like he's less like Leslie Nielsen. No, there's nothing to see here, you know, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And they got the canine dogs. Rah, 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 rah. He's like, no, 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 no. And then he says, out of nowhere, he hears in his ear, I'll take the dogs. And it's Tracy Smothers who's standing there and nothing but a towel with shampoo running down his face. And he starts shadow boxing the dog and the canine dogs. And Tommy's like, Tracy, no. And he pulls him in before, you know, Tracy starts chat, you know, boxing, you know, the dogs because you know, Tracy Smothers known for wrestling bears. So, you know, there's plenty of, you know, riots, but locker room, the, the, the only one I the, 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 the uh, stall out between uh, New Jack and Pipple Anthony. In Queens. I will uh, I will move on and I will ask you this. Vince McMahon, did you ever have a one on one meeting with with him? Uh the night ECW invaded Raw, uh, you know, we you know went there to promote our pay per view and all that good stuff. Uh after I didn't see Vince then, but like after the show, we all had to like line up and you know, meet Vince, you know. Is Paul and Vince in the grill position. We all lined up to, you know, shake his hand. It's kind of like meeting the Pope kind of thing, you know? <clears throat> so it, it comes my turn and Paul goes, Vince, this is the blue me. And he goes, ha, 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 meanie. And she, <laughs> I don't pal. <clears throat> and that was, you know, the extent of that until I uh, went to WWE. Uh, and I always saw Vince, you know, hey, Vince, how you doing? Hey, meanie, how you doing? You know, shake hands, all that, because it's like, you know, he's he, at TV, he's everywhere. But it wasn't until, like, you know, the one-night stand thing happened, and then, um, you know, they brought me into Sacramento, and uh, I was supposed to work JBL that night, and uh, the whole thing felt weird, because, I, you know, they, you know, Dreamer comes in, we want to bring you in. It's, it has nothing to do with JBL. So I get there. And Johnny Ace goes, yeah, you're working JBL tonight. I'm like, son of a bitch. Tommy, you lied to me. So I'm like, and he's like, yeah, you're going to hit him with the moonsault. You're going to pin him. One, two, three. I was like, does John know this? <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, I'll be great. So I'm walking around. And I must have had a look on my face because Triple H walks up. He goes, Meanie, you, you look up. You look worried. I was like, yeah, man, I feel like, I feel like this is a, I'm being set up for something here. And uh, he, he, he goes, stand here. And he goes off, comes back, and then he comes comes and gets me. He brings me into Vince's office. 
And Vince is sitting there at this table eating a steak. Uh, Meanie, I'll be right with you. And he's watching the, uh, he's watching parts of, the, you know, uh, Hogan knows best. Cause that, that is about to be a, a thing. Hogan, Hogan knows best. He's watching some clips and stuff like that. So I have to go in the other room and he had like an L shape, like leather couches. I'm just sitting there like, like I'm in the principal's office, even though I've done nothing wrong, you know? So he comes in and he goes, I understand you're, uh, you're, you're worried. Well, yes, Vince. Uh, and I gave him the, uh, you know, the cliff notes of the history between me and JBL and for those watching me and JBL since made up. So you can stop bringing it up. Um, we're friends now. It's been 16 years. Um, he goes, well, Beanie, if John does goes into business for himself, then he's fired. I was like, he said it. He said fired. <laughs> I was like, well, I appreciate it. And then I also said, hey, hey, no, I didn't get to see you, you know, after I got released. But, you know, thanks for the opportunity you gave me back in 98, all that stuff. And, oh, well, you're welcome. But that was you know, basically that him, you know, reassuring me that John wasn't going to do it, go into business and do anything in the ring, which you never know, you know, me and John went off, you know, to have a talk and, you know, you're at TV, you know, there's always signage, you know, catering, seamstress, gay fabe, finish room or whatever. And we're me and John, you know, John was like, you want to go have that talk? I was like, sure. We're walking and we're walking and walking and we're walking to a part of the building where I see no more see no more signs. I'm like, dude, if we go into a room and there's plastic on the floor, I am <laughs> out of here. You know, I don't want to be like Joe Pesci at you know in Goodfellas. He walks in a room thinking he's being made and yeah, or or he starts talking about Huey Lewis and the news in the. <laughs> I think Hip to Be Square was uh, one of their most finest work. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's, he's got the raincoat on. John, it's not raining in here. Uh, why you got oh, dearie me, dearie. I, I can ask you this then. 1999, early 1999, and um, we'll forget about the Job Squad world because I'll bring that up maybe another time. Who can say? You had a dance off on like Jack or Heat or Shotgun or whatever it was with Brian Christopher. Yeah. Why do wrestlers love to dance? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it was me who started the whole thing. Cause you know, you know, we were in Queens, New York and Paul's like, we're going to do this thing. It started off with me and Bubba, right? Well, then again, I didn't start off because Bubba was doing the dancing in ECW and Paul wanted me and Bubba to have this dance off. And Paul goes, can you dance? I went, yeah. And in my head, I'm going, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, uh, we do the thing and it just, it became my thing, but you know, then me and Tracy Smothers had a feud and we would halt the match for a dance off, which would lead to the heat. But seriously, I don't, I don't know what the, you know, rest, you know, they go anywhere, any ballet pop pal, but, uh, it's a little bit of disco. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, it's, it's certainly added years to my career. I could say that. Well, Thank it made God. Rikishi's career. I just, yeah. I just, yeah. I find it so... I find that one strange, the whole dancing thing. But, like, you and Brian Christopher have this little dance-off for some reason. I think it's very organic. That it's not like, you know, it wasn't like pre oh, Who Who knows? Who knows? But uh, it was yeah. one of the more interesting matches I've ever seen. That was the only match I watched in preparation for this interview. <laughs> you, only the best. Only, only the best. Only the best. Oh, uh, I'm going to ask you this as well. Then WrestleMania 2000, you're in the game. Is yes. that the only game you're in? I was in WrestleMania 2000, and then I was in a storyline mode for the first SmackDown game, uh, where like you have a interaction with me in the locker room, which unlocks my gear, which you can <laughs> you can make me. So maybe that was their, their way around of paying me. Uh, but uh, no, no, those those are there were. Those were the only two WWE games, and uh, I'm in a game now called Retromania Pro Wrestling, which yeah. you can get on any platform. Which is it's flattering that in 2021, I went from having like next to no merch, you know, between you know, uh, you know, on WWE I didn't have any action figures. I left WWE right as they were coming out with the uh, 
or bone crunching figures, which I missed out on. Go back to ECW too late because they were coming out with their ECW line of figures. So I got there too late for those. It took me till, you know, a couple of years ago, I got, I got my first action figure, you know, with, uh, figures toy and now Chella, uh, toys is making a few, but as far as merch is, it's, it's, it's insane that like, you know, everybody said other people's words is, you know, that my character was the most toyetic character, you know, you know, and I had no merch, but now in 2021, I'm so fortunate to have so many people who want to make an investment and make a product with my likeness on it. So it's pretty cool. It's funny you use the word toy attic because that's a word that keeps using. It's like in a Netflix series called the toys that made us. And I've seen the wrestling figure. I've seen them all the thing, but I've seen the wrestling figure one. They keep bringing up that word. I don't know. It's like a Mattel, uh, uh, word or something like that. Uh, going back to WrestleMania 2000. In fact, I'll, I will ask this. You're in the game now. You're in a game then. No numbers, obviously, because that's between you and the tax man. But uh, yeah. which one did you get paid more royalties for? Oh, WWE, uh, no mercy. That was that was that was good money. Because um, you always hear the stories of, oh, I got paid this for that and this and the other thing, and I got that check, and I was like, wow. And you know, we always we always refer to uh, you know the extra you know t-shirt and video game money is. Money's I, money I didn't have to take a bump for. So the more money uh, you can make for not taking a bump hmm. was the best. But, yeah, that, that was a good check. And, then of course, you know, the tax man came for that. With uh, WrestleMania 2000, the game, I should say. Um, oh, yeah, I was in WrestleMania 2000. No Mercy was the, the one after that. Yeah, yes. which is I, the greatest wrestling game of all time. Uh, yeah. No Mercy is fantastic still. I never got into the modding thing where you could download your own. Oh, I'd never had a Game Shark, whatever one of those things were. But uh, uh, with the... Well, the, the cool thing about being in WrestleMania 2000 was they had put my dance in the game. And uh, WrestleMania 2000 was the American game. There was like an all uh, virtual, virtual, virtual pro wrestling game in Japan, which was the main engine for what became No Mercy, WrestleMania, WCW Revenge. So my game, my dance got put in the game. So I was... Just, when they put out the Japanese version, you can make me in the Japanese in virtual pro wrestling. And then my dance was still in the game for, you know, every other game, you know, that on that engine, so to speak. So. Yeah. I, I love that they couldn't copyright taunts. So you do the little joystick thing and then it does, you know, it does the ear thing. So you can actually make Hulk Hogan in it or whoever you want to make. I think I made Hulk Hogan, Yoko Zuna and myself. And that was it. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think what else. Uh, yes, WrestleMania 2000 again is. Uh, I also remember that your appearance in that for the awful Titan Tron that accompanied it, where it's you dancing, and it's like four frames, and then it like that, <clears throat> and that's the entire Titan Tron. How long did that take you to film? Are we talking <laughs> minutes or are we talking seconds? Oh, minutes. Uh, <laughs> that was a. <clears throat> excuse me. That was a Michael Cole production. Really. Uh, I forget where we were, but they're like, Hey, Meanie, uh, we want to do your Titan Tron. So they just had me stand in front of a blue screen and just do like almost like green screen stuff, you know, do a dance, do it, do a facial, blah, blah, blah. I think at one point I was laying on my back, you know, just, I don't know what I was doing, but <laughs> yeah, I probably had the worst Titan Tron in the history yeah. of WWE. And it's good that the facial didn't make it into the final product as well. If it was just you, yeah. Michael Cole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh who who picked the music that euro techno music i didn't know that was going to be my music until i was hitting the ring <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah yeah I, I we had uh, music as uh, there was music with the job squad and then you know once i became uh, i i started doing blue dust used gold dust music but then when i was on my own i had no idea that was going to be my music until it was my music now coming down the ring the blue meanie mm, you know mm, 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 mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's something there's a kid out there who did a a, a a dance to that song i want to say his name's corval or corvel he's from the uk and he does a really cool video to that song where he, he does my dance but works it in with 
a whole bunch of other dances. So you get a chance to look that up. That is, it was really flat. Anytime somebody does something as an ode to something you've done, it's pretty cool. But for the guy who had the least dancing ability for somebody to do a dance to my dance, it was pretty cool. Uh, how much time do you have, or do you want to put this podcast down now? We've, I think we're, you know, an hour in now. But I'm happy to talk all day. I've got a million questions, but if uh, you're <laughs> sick of me, we can uh, wrap it up. Uh, we could go for a little bit longer. A little bit longer, okay. Then, well, since you uh, asked, or since you mentioned, excuse me, that um, it's always flattering when somebody does your stuff. When was the first time Scott Hall or Kevin Nash or anybody gripped you and said, "BWO"? Hold up there, buddy. Where's the where's my royalty check? Where's my cut from uh, that that blatant parody? Uh, well, when I first went to the WWE, uh, I saw Xbox. I was like, "Hey, man, I uh, hope you guys didn't mind the BWO thing." He's like, "Ah, oh, man, we loved it. It was it was cool." He's like, you know, he would say that, you know, and Scott Holt later on would say, you know, after we would do a show, we'd find a local bar and put on tv and watch ECW and, and then um eventually i got i met scott hall when i was you know uh in ecw where he did that loop in ecw and he said yeah um oh he used me as a, as a way to rip kevin nash he's like well since the bw is the blue word order and the blue meanies me i should be the leader of the nwo kind of like this ribbon Kevin Nash that he should be the leader of the NWO and stuff like that. They were all very cool about it. You know, Nash is awesome about it. You know, um, eventually met Hogan, uh, briefly when I went back to WWE, when we did the, uh, SmackDown raw super show. And, um, yeah, he was like, Oh, I was, I was great. You know? So yeah, the NWO guys were definitely cool about the, uh, the NWO guys were definitely cool about the B- BWO. Definitely. Like they weren't going, oh, hold up. I, you know, they all took it as flattering and they weren't trying to get any extra money for it. Because obviously it's a parody, a parody and they can't sue. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, if anybody would have su- sued, it was, it would have been Eric Bischoff. And uh, the word is, you know, WCW wanted to sue and they couldn't do par- They couldn't sue because of parody law. But uh, recently on Bischoff's um, podcast, he was very complimentary about it as well. Uh, I forget. I, I, I would say it was him and Conrad, and uh, they were talking about it was cool how you know the fans always did the capital W with the B, small B, capital W O, and then they were talking about like all the uh, you know, the knockoffs or whatever. And, and he goes, and Eric Bischoff goes, I think uh, you know, Blue Meanie and those guys were they're the first ones to do, it. and that was that was really cool and stuff like that. So, you know, I guess now these he. You know, I guess in WCW he had to do what he had to do to maybe stop it or whatever, you know, because it's 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 business. But in hindsight, he's been very complimentary about it. With um, sticking with WWF a slight bit more because I, I was a much bigger the WWF fan than ECW because we didn't really get ECW here until the I got the yeah. videotapes after the fact after it was going. But uh, uh, with WWF, uh, you are paired with Goldust. And then Ryan Shamrock, Alicia Webb, joins in. There's a little crazy family going on. Wasn't it weird? Right, they're not related, Ken and Ryan Shamrock. But was it still weird when they were dating? <laughs> uh, I, I guess. You know, uh, I, I tried to like not pay attention to that stuff because I figured the less I knew, the, the <clears throat> less trouble I can get into. Um. But yeah, I guess it's like anything like, you know, you always hear about, you know, actors and actresses on movie sets you're around each other long enough and you all have a common, you know, business, you know, it, it, it's only natural that, you know, you know, on screen turns into real life, you know, especially in the wrestling business, which uh, having a relationship in, in the wrestling business is pretty tough, you know, if you're both talent because eventually somebody's going to get jealous of the other person and you know, somebody's going to get the push and the other person's going to might, might be sitting at home and that might cause some friction. So, and, uh, you know, but like when it comes to other people's really, you know, I try not to pry or, or gossip, you know, cause you know, the wrestlers are, the wrestlers like to gossip a little bit. They're like old ladies in a hair salon, you know? I know, but I mean, for me, I knew they were dating. I was like, 
That's your on-screen sister. How could you? It just didn't quite work <laughs> out for me, you know. Uh, with Shamrock as well, you have the, I don't know if it's the honour, the dubious honour, or the or the terrifying task of hitting him with a chair shot. It was there a discussion beforehand of how hard you had to hit him? Uh, well, Ken is a man's man, so, like, he, he wouldn't care if you laid it in to him. Uh, and that was another weird thing where, I hit Ken with the, the that chair shot, and the arena in the arena it sounded like a gun went off. The crowd went ooh, right. I get to the back, you know, I go to the gorilla. The guys go, good shot, you know, good chair shot. And then again, Jack Lanza comes over, you know, he goes, "What was it with that chair shot?" <laughs> I was like, I, I I didn't know what to say. Because I don't want to go, well, they think it's good. Uh, in the arena, it sounded loud. But maybe because he was watching on the monitor in the back, the sound wasn't that good. I don't know what it was. And that's the thing where this side's telling you doing good. This side's telling you something sucks. And you got to just figure out what the, the, the middle is, you know. But, yeah, that chair shot, when I hit Ken, it sounded like a gun went off. And it like, boom. The crowd went, oh. But then you get to the back, you get to the gorilla. Oh, great chair shot. You get further into the building. Oh, what the hell was that? Can't win. Did you, uh, when you had the chair in your hand, were you just thinking, do not hit him in the back of the head? Do not hit him in the back of the head. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of don't do the things to other people that you don't want done to you. And uh, he's got, he's, he, had the, he had that wingspan. So uh, he had an he had ample back for me to, to lay into. And I knew he would, he was, yeah, you know, he 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 could take it. He could he could take it, and he could dish it out. Uh, I'll ask you one more question, then we'll go to the little main event, and we'll do a rapid fire version of uh, the firing line where I'll fire names at you. But uh, one more question uh, that I remember first seeing on WrestleCrap, not long after uh, that website came out, and they were talking about something called the Blonde Bitch Project. This one yeah. somehow passed me by at the time. Now, obviously, it's a pastiche of the Blair Witch Project but it was nice. also meant to mock Sable but yeah. only one vignette aired it was only one and then it got scrapped so what were you told I'm assuming it was a Vince Russo idea uh, what were you told by Russo where it was going to go and what was, what was to be accomplished uh, the Blonde Bitch Project was uh, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara uh, it was their idea I got called up to go up to the warehouse uh one random day and me and stevie filmed basically you know scene for scene scenes from the the blair witch project in, in parody form and uh <laughs> yeah we we did all the uh every scene that you've probably seen like in the greatest you know when people have done the parody of the movie we did and then um you know it uh, the, the the end scene was, you know, in the Blair Witch Project, you know, the guy runs through the house, goes down to the basement, and the friend's in the corner, and then the camera falls over. <clears throat> well, I hear Stevie calling my name. I'm looking for Stevie. Stevie's calling my name. I run into the house, which was Ed Ferrara's house, a little inside baseball. I run downstairs to the basement, and Stevie's in the corner. He's wearing Sable's cat suit and had a blonde wig on. <laughs> he goes, Hey, Meanie, are you ready for the grind? And he starts doing the grind, and then the camera falls over like in the movie. And <laughs> blonde bitch project. So I was going to be on the first SmackDown, and they air, it was supposed to. Did they air have one on Heat? Like the first one had on I, Heat? I, that might have been the pre. It. it, it it aired live to the crowd because we we're in Kansas City. It was our first time back to Kansas City after the Owen incident. And uh, they aired it live to the crowd. So if you're in Kansas City, you saw it. And it got a decent reaction at, you know, the uh, the monitor. You know, I remember guys going, oh, man, that was great. And then they aired the vignette. And then, you know, it was supposed to debut on, maybe they did the uh, precursor on, Sunday night heat and the rest was supposed to be on SmackDown, but I set my VCR to record it and I'm sitting there watching it. It never aired. 
So uh, go to the TVs next week. And uh, Vince and Ed come up to me and go, look, we're ready to roll with it. But then USA Today put out an article about, you know, the mania of uh, the Blair Witch, you know, how popular the Blair Witch Project was and all these spoofs of it. They go, uh, as a matter of fact, on the first episode of SmackDown, they're going to have the Blind Bitch Project. And this was in USA Today. So uh, word got back to Vince. He's like, oh, what's this? It's like, and Russo said Vince never saw the Blonde Witch Project. He didn't get it, so they scrapped it. And it was as simple as that. You know, I, I'd, I'd also heard at one point, but I think this might be wrong, is that the WWF and Rena were in, you know, doing battle legally. Uh, and was it cut? that reason as well or was that never the case that's that's a very good point it, it, it could have it could have been it could have been but as it was explained to me that this vince didn't see it if vince didn't get it vince didn't see the movie vince didn't get it so <clears throat> you know give somebody else the time you know and uh in the first episode that you were playing wwf in your house what character were you playing as Oh my god! I told, I don't even remember. I'm Ed Johnson. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that was so the best pick you could have done for that as well. It just it would have made it, it was just the best pick. Yeah, it's probably a little uh, little thing for them to pop about too. You know, <laughs> or they have their uh, had their issues with Ahmed. Oh dear, I'm Ed Johnson. I'd actually love to have him on. He's crazy, it seems, but I'd still love to have him on. But uh, for now, <laughs> I will. Sorry. What could what could have been? They were giving him a push. He was over as a million bucks, but I don't know. Things just went wrong. It's a shame. Mm. I know he kept getting injured, and I know at one point I think he collapsed on a. F- uh, I'd have to read it up. I know at some point something went wrong that wasn't an injury, and like right. several of them hap- happened, you know, in a few months. But I think it was in SummerSlam '97 or just beforehand. He joins the nation, yeah, which made no sense. But it worked. There was a there was an interview. He comes out and he was great. It was the best thing he ever did. And then he got immediately injured. And then they had to take him out. And then they yeah. made him a good guy again. And then he got injured five more times. Yeah, brutal. <laughs> brutal. It happens. It happens. I will. Uh, I'll give you the main event now. The firing line. And I shan't keep you too long. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, attitude era wrestlers. And okay. uh, if you want to throw in a story, you're more than welcome to. I encourage it. If you want to just speed through it, I, I totally understand. But I'm going to give you the first one here, Paul Bearer. Uh, I love him. Uh, Paul Bearer, me and Paul Bearer were friends for years before I went to WWE. We're AOL Instant Messenger buddies. Uh, big fan of, uh, I, I, I forgot the guy's name. They call him the possum. But, my first day at WWE, go to Sunday Night Heat, and uh, they're setting up something for the. Uh, he's setting them production he, with the production guys, and they're melting candles for the, the Broods entrance. He goes, and he goes to the guy, you know, uh, me has been my friends for years. Only guy never asked me for a job. <laughs> and the fact that you know I was friends with you know Paul for all those years and never asked him for a job meant a lot because he had a lot of friends who try to uh, impede on their friendship by asking for a job. Mm. I love him. I miss him. Uh, Godfather also told me once that he was the greatest roller of joints. Um, Probably, yeah. I just, of all yeah. people, I don't want to judge a book by its cover, but of all people, I would not have put him at the top. <laughs> I'll uh, ask you the next one. As my brother's ringing me, I'll turn that off. Uh, Bob Holly. Uh Bob Holly, man, he's a man's man. Uh, he's like one of those uh, nature guys now. Like he'll just go out in the woods with like nothing and just live off the land, you know, for a couple of days to reset his mind. Uh, he was a hardcore, well, no pun intended, uh, gym freak. You know, he would work out. I worked out with Bob Holly one time in England. And I went back to my room and I was trying to put the key in my door and my arms were so dead. I had to sling my arm up like <laughs> making a Bernie's it and try to get it in there in, into the thing. And, uh, you know, Bob would go to the gym at like 
5 a.m., 4 a.m. And one time Al was, Al Snow was rooming with Bob Holly. And Al was like, man, I got to take a leak, but I don't want to wake Bob up because if he wakes up, he's going to want to go to the gym and I want to sleep. <laughs> so Al says he, he's getting up and he's, you know, you know, tiptoeing across the room and he heard Bob stirring to sleep go like, and he went, and he, <laughs> and he froze like a deer in the headlights until Bob like went back, you know, like, uh, and then he's like, oh, okay, now I can go to the bathroom. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> Bob was like, oh, you're awake. I'm awake. Let's go to the gym. <laughs> oh, my God. I've got, a, I've, I've got a gym in my garage, and I can't force myself to go in it. it just how, how people have the energy, I don't know. Shame of man. Shame of man's awesome. He was a big well, ECW fan as well, wasn't he, Shane? The, the story was he wanted to buy ECW and make it a, a digital online show, you know, precursor to what we have now with streaming, you know? But he was going to put it on WWE.com. Huge WWE fan. I mean, a huge ECW fan. When I got there, he, he knew exactly who I was. He produced a couple uh, promos uh, or skits. Uh, there was one where uh, I made a joke about something with me and Al. I made a joke about Pepper, about him eating Pepper, you know. And Al beat me up and, you know, threw me over a table and stuff. And Shane produced that. And any okay? Yes. Yeah. He was just a, a young guy, a cool guy. Uh, and, you know, it's awesome to be around. Uh, Scott Taylor, Scotty Too Hotty. The nicest guy in the business. Uh, Scotty, uh, Scotty Taylor's awesome. I first met him. He worked for ECW on the, the, the Massachusetts Loops. I want to say it's Scotty Taylor. Uh, Soft spoken, polite, can work. So then we run into each other in WWE and it's like, Oh my God. Hey, what's up, man? Uh, I I'm jealous of him. He uh, met Sammy Hagar in the airport one time. <laughs> Hagar gave him tickets to a show, which, you know, I'm a big Van Halen fan, uh, of both eras. Don't fight me, Sammy and Dave. And the only two people I haven't met are Sammy and Dave. So he got to meet Sammy in the airport randomly. And, I've held it against him ever since, but I, I love him. I love him. Uh, I'll give you a few. I'll say a few more. I've got quite a few more, but I'll speed it up a little bit. Roz. Uh, awesome guy. Draws. Uh, again, young guy, cool guy. Uh, he's from this area. He's from Philly. Well, he's, he lives in Hamilton, New Jersey, Mays Landing area, which is like 45 minutes from here. Uh, we bonded, you know, just from both, you know, living in Jersey, being young guys, he came to ECW. Uh, that's where I initially, you know, got to be friendly with him. Uh, did a couple matches with him on the Indies when WWE would let us do indie shots. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately he had his accident and, uh, you know, he, you know, uh, it happened in long Island, but then he came to Philly and I would visit him in the hospital, you know, uh, he was at the Hahnemann hospital here in Philly. And then, uh, you know, just, uh, unfortunate what happened, but uh, I, I ran into him recently, uh, maybe a year ago, he came to icons convention and talk about a guy who's been through a lot, but has an amazing spirit. And, uh, you would never know, you know, you know, anything that happened to him because he's just like a positive guy, positive attitude. I love him. Love him. Great guy. I, I never asked this before because it is a downer and everything, of course, and it, it right. was a terrible, terrible accident. But uh, were you there that night when it happened? Because as far as I can gather, it was just a confluence of weird circumstances, and obviously yeah. no one was to blame. But uh, were you there that night? Yeah. And uh, the sad part about it is Draws and Dilo were hanging out all day. Uh, Dilo brought, like, his PlayStation, and him and Draws were playing video games, you know, some some car game they were playing. And then uh, they, they were working that night, and it was the scary thing is I was in a similar situation that they were in that happened to them. Dilo was setting up for this is my interpretation from what I I remember seeing. Dilo was going to go for the the sky high power bomb where he picks him up, takes a couple steps, sits out into a tiger bomb, whatever. Um, I think. They went up a little bit awkwardly. And in my mind, 
Draws was going to go back down to reset the move. And D'Lo thought he had him. In my mind, D'Lo thought he had him. And D'Lo went for the sit out while D, uh, Draws was going for the reset. And that's where the accident happened. And I had done a similar thing uh, when I was before, when I was, you know, Brian Rollins wrestled pre Blue Meanie. There's a guy I was wrestling named uh, Vinny Magnetti, and we would do a thing where I'd be in the corner, he'd run, flip up my body, and then roll out into a Frankensteiner. And then on the second one, he was going to do it, but this time I would walk out and do the sky high sit out power bomb. And something happened, and I went for the power bomb on his first Frankensteiner, and same thing happened. Luckily, he was okay. But that brought me back to that moment. It's, 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 it's a horrible situation. Yeah. And um, in the heat of the moment, you can't ov- obviously remember everything. Uh, I, my theory, uh, why I've got a theory, I've got a theory, but uh, he was actually wearing like a, a sheer mesh top mm-hmm. at the time. And some people I think have advanced that maybe it was slippy or something like it was something that he normally wouldn't wear. So maybe D'Lo couldn't get a grip, but you know, there's, there's many theories out there and, um, what's done is done unfortunately but i'll uh, i shall move on uh hopefully to uh cheerier uh stories uh miss kitty miss kitty uh stacy carter stacy carter awesome awesome lady uh I, I met her i knew her mainly through wwe but she's always uh pleasant always kind uh she's a very kind person you know she takes care of uh you know pets and animals now in her her everyday life uh great person uh jackie moore jackie's uh tough tough she can beat the shit out of most men everybody uh, says that word about jackie they're tough oh wow tough she she can she can hang with the hang with anybody uh, again i worked out with her one time and <laughs> went noodled armed that was in uh, long island we we were all we're, she was showing us some uh, new tricep workout. And uh, I was just like, ugh. Trying <laughs> to put my key back in the hotel thing, you know. <laughs> Son of a bitch. I bet you were really happy when they had those key card things. So you just wave it with your yeah. arm. Sort of... <laughs> I look like an you know, inflatable wacky. I was like in Bailey's entrance, you know. Just... <laughs> like the second-hand car. Yeah, car yeah. sales place. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, uh, yeah. Steve Blackman. Oh, Steve Blackman's my favorite. Uh, pre 9 11, going through an airport with Steve Blackman was the best because Steve Blackman did not give a crap. <laughs> uh, excuse me, sir. We need to look in your bag for that. No, and <laughs> take, it, take his bag and keep walking. And nobody said anything. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm a people watcher, you know, like I'll go to a, a mall and sit on a bench and just look at people. So I get on the plane. I'm watching everybody come on the plane. Well, walk on the plane. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, Steve will walk on and I'm just watching him. I'm watching him because I know he's got a short temper. And uh, this one guy, old guy, just stops dead in front of him. Slowly puts his roller bag in the overhead. You know, slowly starts to take his jacket off. Starts to fold. This <laughs> black man goes, "Come on!" <laughs> I went, "Oh, sorry, sorry." Like the guy totally forgot there was a line of people behind him, but he's like, "Do do 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 Come on! I, I just popped huge, and like black man later would say, "Dude, I, you're the best to have around. You pop for everything I do." I'm like, "I love you, man. You're great." Was he was he like not keen on people searching his bag because he had to travel with nunchucks? No, I just you can you can throw, if you're in the airport long enough, you're tired of just people looking through your bag. As, you know, everybody's like, "Oh, wrestlers in the '80s always wore fanny packs." Well, yeah, it's because it helped you get through airport security quicker. Hmm. Emptying your pockets, just keep everything in the fanny pack. Throw that on there. And... I, I feel sorry for anyone who had a belt. And everybody wants to try it on, and everybody, hey, we've got a champion, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, I'll give you Prince Albert. Awesome, awesome, awesome guy. Uh, met him when uh, went to WWE. 
Um, and then, you know, when WWE would let us do uh, indies, I did a Boston loop and he's from up in Boston area. And he's like, Hey man, just come stay at my house. And like, it was like the coolest weekend ever. He had like a, a place right on the beach up there in Massachusetts. Yeah, uh, we went and did a, a couple shows, hung out with him, cooked a big meal, hung out, had some wine. This real chill dude, real cool dude, uh, stud athlete. Uh, he was really cool with me doing a parody of him. I, I was Prince Albert. Uh, Stevie was wrestling Prince Albert, and then I came out as Prince Albert. <laughs> and then uh, Stevie threw Prince Albert out of the ring. I put the boots to him. I rolled in the ring and, you know, for Stevie to pin me. So the referee would think I was Prince Albert. <laughs> and then he comes in and just destroys us both. And later, you know, earlier how I talked about, you know, I had, I thought I had the best match of my career with the Hardys and Goldust and Terry Taylor tore it apart. Me and Stevie get back to the locker room for that. He's like, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. He's like grown men. were back here horse laughing at, you know, what you guys were doing. I was like, you know, it's just, it, that, that was like a really cool, one of my coolest moments was with, with Prince Albert in WWE. Like to imitate Prince Albert, do you have to wear like a mohair sweater, like a brown mohair sweater? Dude, it was great. They, well, it was, it was great doing it. It was, it was horrible taking it off because they had to, they were gluing, they had like an Afro wig and they're cutting it and they're gluing the hair to me. And I, I you know, Prince Albert had extra gear. He let me try it on. I just remember Ron Simmons and Bradshaw walking around the corner and they look at me and they're just like, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> what's going on here? You know? <laughs> and then, um, yeah, then I, I, you know, the little secret to that is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the most over guys in the, in the wrestling locker rooms was uh Johnny canine bruiser bedlam. Yeah. A, a bunch of us knew, I knew bruiser, Al knew bruiser and like, Val Venus, who's Canadian, had heard stories of Bruiser. So we, we always do our imitation of Bruiser Brown. I'm like, hey, buddy. Hey, bro. How much you left? You a six plate man? You a six plate man? You know, <laughs> you know put your hand up. <laughs> if we're in prison, I'd sell you for a pack of cigarettes. You know, and you, <laughs> you know, Bruiser had the mustache. You, you know, hey, man. Hey, buddy. Hey, bro. You know, do your uh, Bruiser Bedlam imitation. So when I'm coming out as Albert for Prince Albert, I'm, Doing Johnny Canine Bruiser Bedlam all the way to the ring. Hey, buddy. Hey, bro. How much you left? Yo, five play man. Yo, five play man. And I'm trying to pop Albert, who's in the ring, and he's like, you know, stop. You know, dude. If you'd taken your top off and had true to the crew on your on your belly, that would have been that would have been the absolute strawberry on the Sunday. That one. The the funny thing about that tattoo is, uh, you know, him and his guys in prison. We're like, oh yeah, we'll get out. We'll get the tattoo to the crew. And he get out. He got out, and he didn't get the tattoo. And his buddy called him. And goes, hey man, I get out next week. So he ran to the tattoo shop to get the tattoo put on his stomach. <laughs> oh shit, let me go get that tattoo. <laughs> you know? These were guys Johnny Canine Bruiser Bedlam was scared of. So I can only imagine what they did. Mm. Um, well, if Bruiser Bedlam burnt down a police station, I've got to imagine the rest of them like African warlords who killed thousands. Something like yeah. that. I, sorry. No, I got, I got to wrestle Johnny K9 in a match for Scott Demore in Windsor, Ontario. And uh, I made the mistake of going, hey, I'd like to do this spot. And it, oh, yeah. All right, buddy. All right, bro. We go out <laughs> in the ring. He just destroys me. <laughs> and like, you know, those cafeteria chairs, there's like all one piece of plate. Hit me one of those, just shatter, gig the back of my head. So he calms down. He goes to the back. And I think he realized how bad. <laughs> so I walk in the back. He meets me. Hey, buddy. Hey, sorry. Hey, bro. Hey, hey buddy. Hey, bro. Sorry about that. Blah, 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 blah. So I see him at a show maybe a month later, whatever, a couple of weeks later. And he sees me at the show. He goes, hey, hey, buddy, come with me. And he made the promoter put me on the show because he felt bad for what he did to me. <laughs> he got me a booking out of it. <laughs> oh, that was, that was soothe the, that was yeah. the, uh, bruised head and the bruised ego i'll give you i had like 10 more i'll cut it down to like four uh okay ivory ivory uh L oh lisa ivory. moretti awesome uh such a character uh just na natural charisma natural talent uh 
never seen her had a bad day, you know, never seen her without a smile. Just, uh, and we, I got to travel with her a couple of times and just, just a bundle of that. I, I was, if she could bottle her energy and sell it, she'd be a millionaire, you know, 3000 times over. Here's one that I've never asked before as well. Tiger Ali Singh. I didn't have uh, much interaction with him. He was there for a short bit. Uh, I got to do something with him, with him in the Royal Rumble. Um, I always had, I always had been taught, you know, if you're in a, a battle Royal, like the Rumble, pair up with somebody and do a, you know, like a little spot just to, you know, pop the crowd a little bit. And I approached him. I was like, Hey man, can I do the spot? And he was, he's very open to it. So when I slide in there, he gets on me, uh, I duck his clothesline and then hit him with a clothesline and do the meanie dance. I got a decent reaction and that's because he was willing to work with me. But he was a good dude. He was a good dude. I don't know why he didn't last there longer. He was a great guy. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this now. Controversial. Ninety nine Royal Rumble is the best Royal Rumble ever. Fight me if you disagree. But I I love it. I love that one. Love it. I yeah. love ninety two. Two thousand and two was great because that was Kurt Hennig and um, Goldust and everyone returning. I love that one. I think two thousand six was good, and then uh, they all sort of just jumbled together in my mind. But man, I love nineteen ninety nine. Just that entire that that bit was the best. To me, it was uh, my Rumble was a good one. Two uh, ninety two with Flair, yep. and then the one Drew McIntyre won. Those are probably the top three for me. Which one was that? Uh, the the last one before the the lockdown at the oh, so uh, two, oh 2020 then it'll be. Yeah, just the way that built because it just looked like Brock was going to win the whole thing and eliminate everybody, and then slowly they start wearing brock down and then when drew hit that that kick on brock just watch the people the people will tell you if it's good or not and the people just went came unglued it was amazing are you saying that's the best royal rumble ever not ever not to me 92 roster wise was like murderers row i was like the best roster all yeah. the dream as a kid, I fantasized. I wanted to see Bob Ackland wrestle Ric Flair, and there they are in the Rumble '92. That was '93, so. in fact. The Flair one? Which one was the Flair one? That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Ric Flair's the, that's the one where he wins it, but I think Bob Backlund, Ric Flair take uh, take place in '93. Ah, I'm having a a Mandela effect man, moment. Man, I, I don't remember much about wrestling, but damn it, Royal Rumbles in the '90s, man. I've 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 got it sewn up. Oh. I'll take your word for it, man. Yeah. Because you know, you, you love wrestling, and then you get into wrestling, and then sometimes wrestling ruins your love for wrestling. <laughs> you know. Uh, I'll give you two more. Then let me think. I won't ask for Kevin Kelly. I won't ask for Mark Henry. I won't ask for. I will ask for Luna Vachon. Love her. Uh, Luna Vachon was probably one of my first wrestling crushes. Really? Yeah. So you like a bit of the kink, then, do you? Uh, dude she just uh i don't know what was. yeah everybody had a crush on you know miss elizabeth uh you know uh medusa yeah everybody had a crush on her but something about luna just no nonsense bullshit you seeing her being up donny allen at tri-state wrestling alliance i was like that's my girl <laughs> no but she was she was the biggest sweetheart um you know uh i wanted to, i was I recently informed that i was probably on one of her last shows in cleveland ohio for cleveland all pro and uh finally i was glad i got the photo with her i, I got to take you know because if that was the last time i saw her you know, i was i was glad to have a, a moment where we were just chilling out and hanging out you know not we were just you know <laughs> She she always go, Meanie, remember that time your balls fell out on Raw? Yeah, Luna, I was there. So, <laughs> yeah, she would always remind me of that. And, you know, she got to meet, meet Mrs. Meanie and they hit it off. And oh, it, was, it was a great day. Your balls fell out. Which, which, how, what were the circumstances very quickly about that one? Because I don't know that. Was this a gold uh, dust shattered dreams thing by any chance? Gold, gold dust shattered dreams. Uh, again, we talk about how it's supposed to be the blue, uh, the Raw boy. So I come out as a raw boy and this is why I'm feuding with Goldust and he jumps me and beats me all the way 
down the ramp, throws me in the ring, sets me up for the shattered dreams kick. Now, mind you, this is, you know, they, we were live on Mondays, taped Tuesdays. So this was the taped one. So he sets me up, leg, leg, arm, arm. I'm just cradled there. And I look up at this the Titan Tron and I just feel it coming. <laughs> and there's nothing you could do. And I felt. Bloop, bloop. <laughs> so I'm standing there. I look up at the screen and there's my nuts on the screen. And I look over at Goldust and he goes, and he runs and does the kick. And uh, I sell out. I go to the back and this is back when the Ferraris and the production truck was inside the building. People at the production truck came out and hey, hey, hey you know, and the boys at the monitor were like, hey, 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 so uh, I go to the bathroom to wash my face off and uh, Goldust was in there. Was like, Man, look like it. Look like you're giving, look like two hooves coming out, like you're giving birth to a baby cow, you know. Just so ever since then, you know, anytime I see Luna, hey, Meanie, remember that time your balls fell out? Oh, <laughs> that's Luna. I remember. We, um, I, they say the camera adds ten pounds, and I just wondered how many cameras they had on my balls. <laughs> With the Titan Tron as well. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Rico Palazzo. Uh, just uh, it was crazy. It's great. I, I back in the day, Shawn Michaels, when he was cutting an interview, always used to look at himself in the Titan Trump when he was yep. doing it. Constantly look at himself to do it. So I imagine you had a similar experience that one time. Oh, uh, I I was going to ask this before, but I'll just I'll slip this in very quickly. Is um, Gold Dust six foot six, rough and tough Texan? How does it feel? You know he's not going to kick you in the butt, right? But he's an enormous man running at you in gold gold and black pleather kicking something very near your balls as hard as he can yeah. at any point did you did you always like lift up a split second before and just in case or it's just a matter of trust you know uh, but then again it's tv you're always told to lay it in on tv so <laughs> there's that uh yin and yang there's that, there's that balance you're trying to find of where you don't want to bail too soon <laughs> but you you don't want to you know go up an octave in your uh your voice so uh -huh. It's just a matter of, you know, trust him. He's, he had done it a million times before. So, but th that thought was there like, here it comes. <laughs> and being yeah, exposed like that. Yeah. Slightly yeah. lower than he's used to as well. For something yeah. to not hit. Yeah. Uh, one last one. Uh, and I hope you've got a story on him because I've never asked about this guy before. Okay. Golga, John Tenta, Earthquake. Uh, John Tenta was an awesome guy. Uh, he had, for a guy who'd done everything he had done, he was just unassuming. Just he would just sit, come in, do what he had to do, you know, do a job and you know, do his job, and uh, didn't really raise much of a fuss. I do remember, you know, uh, somebody said something. Somebody was talking about ribs in the locker room, and he just pipes up. He goes, "I don't rib anybody because I don't want to be ribbed." And I just would pop. I popped for it. I was like, yeah, that's a great motto to have. But uh, very nice guy, sweetheart of a guy for how big he was and, you know, for the, the stuff he had done, you know, feuding with Hogan and all that stuff. Just a, just a guy. Awesome guy and uh, sadly missed. Sadly missed indeed. Uh, we will shut this podcast down. I, I know about 40 minutes ago we said, oh, you can ask a couple more, and we've somehow 40 minutes sort of like slipped on late. So I do apologize for taking up your time, but I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, our time together. And uh, I think I got up to about one third of the questions I wrote as well. Uh, nice. Do you uh, want to give us any plugs? Most of them are on the screen throughout as well, but uh, Mind of the Meanie, where can people find that? Uh, if you would like to listen to more stories, check out my podcast, Mina Demini, which drops every Monday morning at 6 a.m., wherever you get your favorite uh, podcast, myself and Josh Chernoff and Adam Bernard uh, talk about everything from music, movies, movies, sports, and tons and tons of useless knowledge. Uh, if you would like to buy an old school BWO shirt, go to prowrestlingtees.com slash blue meanie. Uh, uh, also, Mina Demini, we have a, a Patreon, so go to patreon.com slash Mind of the Meanie, where you can watch us record each and every episode live as it happens exclusively on Patreon. Um, 
Uh, if you want to, you know, the holidays are coming. If you want to uh, have a birthday wish or Merry Christmas or whatever, go to cameo.com slash blue meanie BWO. And if you want to follow me, like you said, uh, it's been on screen the whole time. On I'm on all platforms, blue meanie BWO. Uh, how did you get the, co- did you need a copyright to do the BWO t shirt? Or is it because it's parody and anyone can do parody. it? Parody. Yeah. They don't, legally, the only people who could rightfully trademark it would be, WWE because they own NWO. Uh, back in the day, I, I tried to uh, trade market and it came back as confusion in the marketplace hmm. because it's both pro wrestling and all that stuff. But yeah, I'm uh, I love WWE. I'm uh, un- un- unabashedly a, a, a homer when it comes to them, you know, because that, that was the wrestling bug that bit me, you know. I start watching wrestling through them and have they been good? Yes, they've been great. And recently they're not so great, but wrestling to me is like pizza when it's good. It's great. And when it's bad, eh, it's pizza. You know, I could put on pro wrestling in the background as you know, like the way you would put on the lullaby for a baby. I just put a pro wrestling in the background that soothes me and puts me in a, in a good state of mind. So. I do the same thing actually because I've got tinnitus, so I've got like a ringing in my ear constantly. And one of me the too, best things, yeah, one of the best things for me is actually very quietly, like screen off, but listen to wrestling commentary and just like it's just an even uh, crowd noise, especially in the old superstars days where they sweeten the uh, where they yeah. sweeten the crowd and it's just a like a, a constant shh, like that, and it's brilliant. It's like a whale song to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that time Balls Mahoney killed a whale with a sport? <laughs> and then, uh, then Gorilla Monsoon will go threaten Bobby Heen and, you know, throw him out of the building. He's like, oh, will you stop? Will you stop? And they're, they're literally going bananas. Yeah. Oh, Hanging from the rafters. See, we could, we could try Gorilla Monsoonism off here, but uh, I will lose. Uh, the, only, the only one that I can pull out of my bag is uh, Greg Valentine uh, takes a good 10, 15 minutes to get warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, what's the one for the back of the occipital external occipital protuberance Ocip- yeah. occipital Cipri- anyway before before my yeah. before my external occipital protuberance falls out uh trying to say that word but uh i will uh listen i will i'll thank you so much for joining us once again i shall shut this pocket down thank you very much for joining us once again we will catch you again next week or whenever i record one of these Cheers, dude. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for having me.